गजानन विद्वान उपयाहि सोमम उपयाहि सोमम ऋग्वेद थ्री पॉइंट थ्री फाइव पॉइंट फोर ट्रिकल्ड The meaning of it is essence. After smashing it and pressing, pressing it, the essence will trickle down. So that the essence is what we are calling as soma. And here, the essence of the whole universe is Sachidananda. Simply, the so soma is Sachidananda. and the other meaning for the trickling is one who is compassionate one is compassionate so it is compassionate soma compassionate sachidananda is soma sharma ji is an abhishave ha ah. ah. abhishave ha ah. abhishave is abhishave. trickling when we okay. when we press something Yeah. its essence will come down it trickles down say maybe we grate some vegetables and uh, just press it so out of that grate we give the liquid that's the essence that's the trickling that sense is the rubbish away so the essence of the whole universe is sachidananda because it is of course i have been telling omnipresent omnipotent omniscient all this formless so move closer to move closer to this soma sachidananda vidwan vidwan means there is one who is not knowledgeable so it is referring to the sachit and is referring to sachit as vidwan they are all mm-hmm. knowledgeable they all know so many things now you move closer to that sachidananda that is your goal to be closer to be in contact and finally enjoy the bliss yes. the sananda ananda swarupa now but all this cannot happen automatically mm. all this cannot happen automatically it has to be deliberate and we have to put our efforts and have to work for it that is what is called as sadhana and how you do it that's the first word prajanan by enriching your knowledge so when you say knowledge it clearly means not information it is real knowledge experience of truth and that is prajanan nya avabodhane that's a root mm. nya avabodhane nya avabodhane avabodhana is knowledge experience realization anything so you work hard gain knowledge remove the fallacies that are there in our mind realize truth Yes, 
you can be closer to Satchidananda. A dullard, a dumb person cannot come closer to Satchidananda. He cannot. She cannot. The passport and visa to go near to Satchidananda is real knowledge. <laughs> if that passport and visa is not there, no, they are not allowed. And we have no other path also, we experience Ananda. This is the only path. Why I am stressing this is, along with this Jnana comes Karma, comes Upasana. It's a threefold thing. You cannot separate these three. They are all fold or woven into one structure. As the strands of ropes are there. So if the rope has to become strong, few strands have to be woven together. Only then it becomes strong. Have to be twisted together. It is one rope. Similarly, we have got Jnana plus Karma <coughs> plus Upasana put together. Why I am stressing on this is, many people talk about these things as separate. They call Bhakti Yoga. That's a route you have got to reach this Achyadananda. Jnana Yoga is another route what you have got. Another route is there, that is Karma Yoga. Another route is there, Sanyasa Yoga. Another route is there, Hatha Yoga. Another route is... So like this, they go on telling hundreds of routes. And finally say, you take any path, finally you reach the same goal. But Vedas are very clear. I have told you earlier also, Na Anya Pantha Vidyate Ayanaya. For your travel, there is no any other route except this one and this one and this one. The emphasis on it. Now, this is the path of knowledge. Along with it, it's not separate. Along with it, we have got another phase of it that is karma, another phase of it, upasana. So, jnana, karma, upasana, they are not three different things, though the words are different, but they are all complement it to one another and to achieve our goal, all the three in unison are required. They cannot be separated. If I say karma, yes, karma has to be with jnana and upasana. If I say upasana, upasana is uh, devotion, okay. So that devotion cannot be blank, that devotion has to be supported by jnana and karma. And major jnana is of no use. It has to get translated into karma and it both jnana and karma should take the help of devotion, upasana. So all the three put together only can stand and can show us the route, show us the right paths. They are not separate and any other thing is not there. There are many religions which uh, say, Okay, you do whatever you want, but do it in devotion, you reach the goal. No, it's not like that. One uh, very glaring example what I can give is, have you heard of this uh, Dharma Vyadha? Any point of time? No. Dharma Vyadha. No. Any one of you, have you heard? No, yeah. no. Yes, yes, Sharmaji. Uh, what is that? That is a person who is actually a Katuka, but then uh, uh, he... Katuka, are you able to understand uh, Vivekji? No. Katuka. Uh, no, you just listen, you just listen. No, I'm you not... are not heard of it, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he knows. So for her sake, I have to give clarification. And you just listen. Katuka is a butcher. Oh, okay. Yes, but then when he goes home, he he serves his parents with so much devotion. So that is why even he is also eligible for salvation, something like that. Okay. Now, that very word dharma vyadha is a paradox. Vyadha is a butcher. Once say butcher, how can we be dharmic? Dharma and butchery will not go together. The very word itself is a wrong usage and is a paradox. And it's not a fact. 
a person if he wants to attain salvation then okay serving his parents is excellent no say about it but if he does butchery as his profession something is wrong with that he says whatever be the profession if he serves his parents yes he will reach the goal now this is the wrong thing what i am telling but it is a very famous story in puranas but uh, vedas do not uh, subscribe to it they are very clear they are very clear you have to do good deeds and good deeds only and if you say in spite of my doing any bad deed any other profession if, if i do good deeds yes i'll be clear no no such thing is there this is a misleading story story and it is a misleading concept if you want to reach the goal there is one and only one royal path and you have to take only that path and no alternatives no crossroads so sharma ji nobody you... will say ah yes please so uh, there are two two questions i have one question is uh, that i mean this is probably the unique example a person who is designated to hang people ha hmm. now that person who is actually pulling that rope is really doing uh, his duty of pulling the rope hmm. but he is right. actually facilitating ha a death ha so now in this case ha uh, no uh, he he may say that, oh just because that's my job and i'm not qualified to do any other job and hence i'm doing it but then um uh, should i par take that job or um i mean do i still qualify for a but the question of his livelihood there correct ah uh, okay now here one uh, wonderful answer is there in the vedas vedas never i repeat vedas never approve capital punishment vedas never approve capital punishment for any reason at any place it may be amazing for you to understand and of course a lot of uh, uh, research and support has been given for this statement what i am making even in war you are not supposed to kill anyone mm it appears uh, something uh, unpalatable but it is true every war in the very concept i'm telling every war it has got two phases one is war with your internal enemies mm. you understand this so if there is a war with the internal animals uh, internal uh, feelings and internal uh, enemies yes external war will be reduced to a very great extent because you are prompted by internal enemies we are waging a war outside now this is not just a vedic thought even what you have heard as jihad in islam you have heard of jihad in islam so in islam this jihad means this type of war war with your internal enemies that is a right meaning but unfortunately these people have misinterpreted it and made this jihad as an external war and all the terrorists are prompted by jihad but jihad basically is a fight with your internal enemies internal enemies you are familiar with kama krodha lobha moha madha matsarya these are the six internal enemies and fighting with them is the real war is a real jihad okay now that is one type of war the external war is for supremacy over natural resources that's what is happening but if the internal enemies are one over then the external war is not required you will have love and affection friendship we will share and live there is no question of uh, grabbing and establishing our mastery over a piece of land or over a piece of forest or a piece of water that becomes uh, two uh, what you call a pit, uh, pittance pittance it becomes too small but fighting the internal enemy is the greatest war what is said in the vedas number 1 so they are not for capital punishment number 2 okay what is uh, giving death sentence very simple question they will ask so death sentence when implemented is nothing but separating the sat from the satchit 
right? The sachit or the soul has got a tool. Now with the tool it is doing so many things. Now it has done something wrong. What is there something wrong? That is using the tool wrongly. So what you are doing, you are separating the tool from the one who is using the tool. That is your death punishment. Okay. Then what is the result? In legal language we call what is known as culpable mind. You have heard of it? Culpable mind. Culpable mind is the mind which is corrupt, which has decided to do something wrong. Only from that it is called as culprit. The word culprit has come from that. Culpable to culprit. That is, one has got a uh, distorted, twisted mind, cricket mind. Yes, he is called as a culprit. And the cricket mentality is called as culpable mind. Now, what have you done for that? Nothing. Culprit is still there, that is in the soul. What you have done is you have removed the, or you have taken back the tool. They have separated them, that's all. Now what will happen to that culprit? That culprit will take another birth and continue the same body. Maybe in this life we have disassociated the tool from the culprit. But culprit still lives, culprit still mm -hmm. exists. Maybe this tool is not there. But in the process of birth and cycle, he gets a tool, he gets a tool elsewhere again. And what is it we have achieved? It says nothing. So what you have to do? Mm. Let the tool be there. Let us prevent him to use the tool in the wrong way. But through that tool only, let us teach him and convert him from a culprit to a pious man. That conversion or the transformation is what we thus say. Then what happens? You give any tool, nothing will happen because you have changed the culprit. You have transformed the culprit. So transforming the culprit is our first target, first priority, rather than separating or disassociating the tool and the culprit. You got the point, sir? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, so what will happen? The net result, you'll see, that's also beautiful. Okay, if you separate the tool from the culprit, we have one culprit less, fine, because that culprit's tool is removed, so for the moment, the problem is solved. But the same culprit will take another birth and continue his same wrong deed, because he is not transformed. But if you transform him, of course we need the tool, through tool only we have to communicate with that person. And if you transform him, a culprit is gone and a pious man is got. Now that's the beauty of it. Because we have transformed him, there is no more a culprit. Because we have transformed him, we have got a good man. So this is a double benefit. A bad man is gone, a good man is got. But in capital punishment, a bad man's effect is temporarily prevented and nothing more we get. <laughs> So this is the Vedic thought, this is a Vedic thought and you can call it as a humanitarian thought and of course a rational and scientific thought, I got a lot of benefits. So Vedas basically do not approve capital punishment at all. So there is no question of hangman, there is no question of hanging or electrical chair <laughs> or whatever you speak of, it's not there. That is 100% ruled out. But to educate him and make a culprit a good man, Yes, we need a lot of things. There you can use Sama, Dana, Bheda, Danda. You know about these four things? Yes. Uh, Sama is to praise him and gradually turn him over. Dana, give something. Bheda, compare with others and tell them you are better. If he doesn't listen to all the three, teach him, no problem. But don't kill him. Danda is uh, giving a physical torture. Fine, you give it. But the purpose is not to give torture, but to convert him. Maybe he is so a hard person, uh, he needs few kickings, fine, give it. He needs some beatings, give it, but don't kill him. If you kill, you are not achieving anything. You are achieving nothing. You are just separating the culprit from the two, and the culprit continues to do his bad things, if not in this life, maybe in another life. So our target is not separation, dissociation, but our target is conversion, transformation. Now this sounds very logical and humane. 
Maybe he needs a better danda punishment. You that you give it. They were not uh, uh, mincing anything. We give it freely until the person gets transformed. Now the support for this is just one word. It is called as shikshana. Shikshana. And another word is there shikshe or shiksha. Shiksha is punishment. Shikshana is educating. And the beauty is this shiksha and shikshana both spurt out from the same root. Now what is that root? Shiksha vidyopadane. To give right knowledge is shiksha. Mm. Whether you call it as education, whether you call it as punishment. Both have the same purpose that is to educate the person, to give the right knowledge. The purpose of education is also that and the purpose of punishment is also that, has to be that. Now this Vedic thought or human thought, if it is not there, yes, if you want to punish a person, the highest punishment is a killing. It is killing only. Whether you call it as hanging or capital punishment and approved by man-made law, whatever you do, it is killing only. Killing is prohibited anywhere, anywhere, as I told you even in war. Because we want to prevent war. We don't want wars at all. And if these external wars have to be prevented, the internal war has to go on. If internal war is there, external war is not there. If internal war is not attended to, you will have an external war every day, everywhere. <laughs> you see, this is a Vedic thought. And if this is properly understood. Yes, even today we can't stop wars which are being waged at one place or the other in the world. And very unfortunate thing here, which I want to add is, there are many countries which live on selling of armaments, in whose budget the major portion is for armaments, selling and major revenue is from selling these arms and ammunitions. Unfortunately, one such country in the list is, America. or the first one in the list is America. <laughs> yes, its major source of revenue is selling arms and ammunition. So that becomes a major source for our income. Then naturally, directly or indirectly, we always support waging of war. We always support at one place or the other. Yes, let there be a war because my commodity will be sold. And that is my source of income. Now this is how so many people think and this is a perverted thinking. Vedas do not approach. This is not a friendly thinking. It is most unfriendly and inhuman thing. Maybe the words what I am using are a bit strong but yes it is reality. And even if this reality is bitter, yes we have to take it. It is a bitter reality. And we do have certain countries which do not approve war, or we have got uh, what we call them as uh, non-aligned, non-aligned. So they don't want to take any side. They want to be neutral. We have such countries also. So when we compare these two things, those countries which are on the non-alignment, yes, they are all directly or indirectly guided by these Vedic thoughts and humanitarian thoughts. So your question was just hanging. Uh, maybe I have given a, a wider answer. <laughs> no, that's good. It was wonderful. Okay, fine. Then what was the other question? The second question I have is, uh, now as you said that uh, in attaining the salvation that we need you know, to know the uh, uh, Mm, yeah, jnana, uh, I mean Bhakti Yog, Karma, uh, karma Yog and, and Jnana Yog. Jnana Yog. Jnana. All put together, they are not separate. All put together, they correct? Are now they are they're all one point. Correct. Uh. Now we know that um, uh, most people, uh, yes they know a little bit of, uh, of Bhakti Marga or maybe quite a bit of people know about Bhakti Marga uh, to, to their interpretation or their understanding of Bhakti in devotion. Um, they, they, one, obvious... one, one second, one second, one second please, one second. Okay. 
Correct. And then uh, most uh, are involved in in action in some form uh, or the other action, but not many uh, are really. Uh, I shouldn't say eligible, but they they either they don't have time or they don't have the guidance. Just like we are getting it from you, uh, uh, the true knowledge. Uh, so, uh, um, um, I mean, how do they how do they even attain this path? How do they even uh, are we then saying that they will never be able to uh, achieve uh, what we should achieve uh, in life? Now the answer is very simple. Uh, in legal language, we have got one word. What is that? Is onus. O n u s. You ever heard it? Onus. Yes. So when I say uh, when I say onus, it means the responsibility is fixed. So on whom that responsibility is fixed, we say the onus is on that person. That person. Uh, that's what it says. Say there are two people. One is a culprit. There is another person who has engaged him to do the wrong thing. He doesn't do the wrong thing, but he engages another person to do it. Now, if I say onus, the onus is on the person who has given the assignment rather than the person who has done it. Actually, a person has done it. He is left out because he is only a tool. He has been guided by somebody else to commit that uh, wrong thing. So, the person who is behind the screen. Yes, he has the onus. He is responsible for it. Say, for example, I allege something and go to a court. Party A alleges something on Party B, and they go to a court. Now there are two possibilities: whether this allegation is true or not. The person who has taken it to the court has to prove. That is, A has to prove. So the onus of proving the allegation is on A. But in some cases. The law says, if there is an allegation, it is for you to refute. I just allegate and leave it. I just make an allegation, leave it. For B, it is his responsibility to disprove it and say I am not wrong. So the onus is on B now. Law takes both views. That is, onus on A in some cases, onus on B in some cases. In the same way, in the same way, for the question what you have asked. The onus of transforming these people who are not exposed to jnana, or maybe some are not exposed to right karma, maybe some are the, some people are there who are not exposed to uh, upasana, anything. The onus is not, I repeat, not on them. The onus is on those people who have been exposed and have got little jnana and capable of converting it to karma, and those who are devotees. Are those for upasakas? The onus of converting them, the onus of making them realize to is on them. They are left out. So if there is a person who is not exposed to jnana, karma, upasana, any one, all the three in a different way, in a wrong way, whatever it is, the onus is not on that person. By God's grace, we are exposed to the right knowledge, and we are trying to put it into action. And we are given a little of bhakti or upasana or devotion. Yes, the onus is on us. So it shall be our duty to reach to them and tell them this is what is reality. This is what you have understand. This is for your good. We are telling. We are not expecting anything. Please transform yourself and enjoy life and experience ananda ultimately. This is the right path. That will make them realize. It. The onus is on us. The onus is not on them. I'll give one small uh, proof for that. Aryam, Kranvanto Vishwam Aryam. Nine point. Six three point five. So it shall be your duty. It is told to those who have got little knowledge and who are putting it into action 
and I got that devotion. It's for them it is referring. You make the world not one person, make the world Arya. Progressive. Now I cannot stop. I cannot stop at this because what does Arya mean? That is very important because I got a distorted history to study. <laughs> And it is uh, a deliberate distortion made by the Britishers when they ruled, especially India. So you know their uh, tactics. Their tactics is to divide and rule. So they created a theory of Aryan invasion. It's not a truth. It's not a truth. I repeat again. So they said Aryans were in the Central Asia and they invaded India and pushed the natives of India downwards to the south and what are those natives called Dravida. So who are living in the southern part of India, they are all Dravidas. Okay, from Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Okay, this is the uh, downward southern part of the India. So they are all Dravidas. And who are in the northern part of India, they are all Aryans and they are natives. They are not natives. They all invaded India. So they are Aryans or a clan. Aryans or a group of people. And these people invaded India and occupied the whole of North India. Now what happens? There will always be a tra struggle. There will always be a uh, war between North India and South India. That's what they wanted. So that they can rule the whole of India comfortably. Because they are fighting among themselves. And they are safe. This trick they have played in many places in the world. Okay, that is a political policy. Let's not uh, discuss about it. What I want to say is this whole historical story, what we have heard, is really a story and not a fact. It is a concocted story for achieving their political goals. Then what do we mean by Arya? That's a very simple thing. Arya. Arya comes from R Gatav. R Gatav is a root. That means one who is progressive, one who moves for progress in the right royal path, he is called an Arya. There is no clan like that. There is no race like that. Anyone who does like this, who has got a progressive mind, yes, one who has got the knowledge of human values, yes, he is an Arya. Whoever he may be, wherever he may be, at any point of time. Now, this is a broad definition what we have got in the Vedas for Arya. A support, once again, take another piece of the mantra. Arya Jyotiragraha. Arya Jyotiragraha. Rigveda 7. Point thirty three point seven Arya Jyoti Ragraha seven point three three point seven of Rigveda. Now, what does it mean? Jyoti is knowledge, light of knowledge. Agra in front, a person, a person. Who leads his life guided by the light of knowledge, he is called an Arya. Mm -hmm. So, definition of Arya itself is something different. Now, in simple words, you can say, Who is an Arya? Arya is a gentleman over. It's not a clan, it's not a group, it's not a caste, it's not a species. It is the way a person lives, and upon it, he is called as an Arya. It's a way of life. So in that way of life, he is always guided by the light of knowledge. Arya Jyoti Ragraha. He is progressive. Gentleman, you can say. So it says very clearly, Veda, you be a gentleman or a gentle lady and make other people as gentlemen and gentle lady. Go over. There is no discrimination whatsoever. I make it very clear. 
So that is a duty assigned to a person who has got little knowledge, little upasana, little karma. Yes, the onus is on him. So you develop, you improve, you become more and more gentlemanly. Yes, then make others also the same. You become noble, you become nobler and make other people noble, nobler. So the whole onus is on the person who is on the right track rather than those who are lost their track. Those who have lost their track, yes, it's not possible for them to even identify that they have lost the track. <laughs> so we pity them. We pity them. You see, this is a very important thing. About it. We pity them because they are our own kith and kin, whoever he may be. The whole world is one family. The whole world is one group. So he is a fellow being and the fellow being has lost the path. Then what will you do? Okay, find him out, bring him onto the track. Because you know at least a little of the track. So the responsibility is on you. Now, this is not just a Vedic thought. This Vedic thought has been, if I am uh, uh, using the right word, is borrowed in Bible also. The same thought. There they give you a different example. They say a shepherd is there. So he is rearing the sheep. Say one or two sheep, they stray away. They go elsewhere. Now what will the shepherd do? He will go in search of them and bring it back into the flock. So you are a shepherd. <laughs> this is what is said in Bible. And the whole concept is based on this Vedic concept. It says very clearly, you are responsible if somebody strays away because you are in the right track. You are lucky enough. You are having a very good opportunity that you have got something to tread the right path. So your responsibility shall be those who have strayed away. You catch them and bring it onto the right path. The onus is on you. So if a sheep is lost, the onus is not on the sheep, but it's on the shepherd. <laughs> so you have to bring it back into the flock. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very logical and very rational. Yes, that is the answer for your question, Yuki. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, one, other, uh, one other statement, something I have heard in the past is that knowledge uh, cannot be given, but it has to be, uh, it has to be taken. Which one? Which one? Knowledge huh. cannot be given, it has to be taken. Yes, both things are true. Both things are true. Okay. In some cases, we are open for knowledge. But uh, a chance will never come that true knowledge comes to us. Hmm. We are thirsty, but there is nobody to give us uh, water to quench it. At the same time, there are people who have got a lot of water with them, but there is nobody to take. <laughs> so both things are true. Both things are true. Yes, there should be a person who is wishing to give. Hmm. And there is a person who is wishing to Take it. Take it. The giver must be what you call uh, very charitable, very free to give. And the receiver should open up his mind and receive it. Mm. Then only things will happen. It's a two-sided one. If only giver is not there, nothing will happen. If there is only a taker, nothing will happen. We have to match the two. This matching is very important. And sometimes this matching happens uh, from our point of view, accidentally. And uh, in other circumstances, it will be deliberate. Whatever it is, only when these two things meet, things will happen. Otherwise, nothing. Otherwise, nothing will happen. And both of them will be uh, dissatisfied. They have got knowledge, no right disciple. A disciple will be there, there is no right guide, mentor. Yes, it's a problem. You should match. So, what best we can do is, as truth seekers, we have to be in search of the right teacher always. You should have an open mind. From where we get the right things, you will take it. From where I am getting, from where I am getting, this house you should be in searching. And the same search should be saved from the teacher's point of view. They also should be in search of to whom I can give this because my life is temporary. One day or other I will go. And all the knowledge what I have acquired with so much of effort, I should not allow it to die with me. I want to make it continue and I want this to reach on to the next uh, uh, generation. So what best I can do? They will be on that search. Now both searches have to meet and meet. things will happen. 
the short one way. Both are right. Both are right. Next one. So it is telling, have the right knowledge, be a truth seeker, and by putting your effort, O knowledgeable person, O knowledgeable lady, knowledgeable uh, man, you move closer to Satchidananda. Prajanan, Vidwan, Upayahi Somam. Be closer. Now we know that Satchidananda is Ananda Swarupa. Ananda is there. So when you move closer to it, yes, you are going to experience the same Ananda. More closer you are, more the experience of Ananda. And less the banks of the Sat world. Sat world, I got, uh, it's a mix of uh, uh, so many happiness, unhappiness, uh, uh, good things and bad things. It's a mix. So more you are closer to Satchidananda, you are away from these mundane problems. What you call it as Tapatraya. So this Tapatraya is a word you know very well. Papa is the heat. Three types of heats we have got here. We have to bear with it. That is Adhi Bhautika problems, Adhi Daivika problems, Adhyatmika problems. So all the three problems put together, it is a trio of three problems. Now the counter thing for these trio of three problems is the three yogas, Jnana, Karma and Upasana. So if you are on that path, you are away from this. If you are away from that, you are into this uh, boiling porridge. So you will be boiled here. If you want to move away from it, take the help of Jnana, Karma and Bhakti. That is real knowledge. Next one. The question what you have asked is answered in the very next one. I did not look into it. Now it is, we have come into it. Prati Grubhanita. Prati Grubhanita. Manavam. Prati Grubhanita. Manavam. Grubhanita. Sumedhasaha. Manavam. Prati Grubhanita. Manavam. Sumedhasaha. Rigveda. Manavam. Ten point. 62.4 10.62.4 Prati Grubhanita Manavam Sumetha Saha Now you see very clearly it says Sumetha Saha Sumetha Saha is men with knowledge yeah. So this whole piece of mantra is addressed to Sumedha Saha only. Those are knowledgeable. So when I say knowledge, of course, karma and upasana, they follow automatically. Because they are not separate. Mm. So Sumedha Saha, oh, people with knowledge, they are reminding us about our responsibility. What is the responsibility? Prati Manavam, every other person. <laughs> Prati Manavam, Grubhanita, make him your own. Mm. Make him, make them your own. Grubhanita, is a Grubhi Grahane, that's the root. Grubhi Grahane. Grahana is to hold them, to take them into your fold, to catch them, to transform them and make your friend. Definitely it is not holding them by force. <laughs> it's not coercion. Maybe in the beginning it may be required, but that's not always. In the beginning it may be required, then with your love, your affection, and with your compassion, make them your own. But that love, sacrifice, compassion, they are not in this mantra. They are not in this mantra, they are elsewhere. I'm just adding it from that source. Here it says very easily, make every other fellow, make every other being your own. Why the assignment is to you? Because here is Sumedha Saha, because you got better knowledge. So because you got a better knowledge, your responsibility is more. For a fellow who is ignorant, 
he doesn't have responsibility because he is ignorant he cannot do if he given the responsibility also he cannot achieve anything he cannot do anything now the responsibility is given only to those who have got knowledge so if got knowledge if i experienced through karma and all this if i have done it with devotion yes your responsibility is more more you know more you are knowledgeable more you are closer to truth more is your responsibility yes it seems very very logical and rational responsibilities can be taken only by those people who know more mm. anywhere anywhere even today say we have got a company so in a company who is at the top rank who is at the lowest level <laughs> and says very simple the one who has got better knowledge who has got better experience yes he will move up the ladder one who doesn't have it has to be in the lower ranks the same law the same thing is telling more knowledge you have got higher the responsibility what is the responsibility to make the other people who are the lower rank to pull them up that's your responsibility because you are at a higher level but that higher level cannot be got until we have got the right knowledge right experience and devotion without that you cannot reach it very chance if you reach that you cannot maintain it you will lose it very shortly because your inefficiency will show up there very logical very logical and even the modern day management principles they are all derived from these words only because the vedic knowledge is universal mm. it's applicable anywhere any time for any person it's the same next one pratarajni pratarajni pratarindram havamahe pratarajni pratarindram havamahe ejurveda 34.34 34.34 okay we shall discuss about it in the next session 